Good morning, everyone. I'm Quinn Wiffen from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Market Your Marketing, How to Drive Discovery of Your Content, and will be presented by a special guest presenter, Sarah Skerrick. Sarah is the Vice President of Content Marketing for PR Newswire, where she oversees all content initiatives for the company with a focus on using a variety of formats, channels, and platforms to acquire audience attention, build engagement, and ultimately generate qualified leads, drive sales, and improve customer retention. Sarah also manages the Beyond PR blog, where she writes about digital PR, social media, and other subjects on which she's also a frequent and well-received speaker. Before we get started and I hand over the presentation to Sarah, we're super excited to have her, but I do have a couple of notes to mention. Today's webinar will be available tomorrow, if not sooner, barring any technical difficulties. We always send out an email to everyone that attends, and that has the link to both the video and the slides, so you can review all the content that Sarah goes over today. We'd also be happy to answer any of your questions, so if you think of anything during Sarah's presentation that you'd like to ask her, just go ahead and take a look at your webinar interface, and there's a little question applet where you can type in your questions, and I can go ahead and get to that once she's done with her presentation. You can also tweet us with the hashtag VMWebinar, and we'll get them that way as well. Any questions we don't get to, we'll be sure to try and answer via email. And if you're having any technical problems, sometimes that does happen, please just attempt to reconnect after you sign out. So with my notes complete, I will go ahead and hand it off to our presenter, Sarah Skerrick. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. And I am just trying to get my slides to advance here. This is, oh, there we go. All right, great. So everyone, hello. I'm Sarah with PR Newswire, and it's nice to meet you all. Um, I am active on Twitter, as is uh, the team from Vertical Measures. And I also recommend following their CEO, at Arnie Kay, uh, who is actually uh, how I learned about the company and uh, how the relationship between the two of us started. And um, just to give you a little context, um, at Content Marketing World this year, Jay Baer really came out of the gate strong. In his opening keynote, he admonished everybody to market their marketing, that you have to put some muscle behind the messages that your organization produces in order to gain attention. And then straight from that session, I marched into a session uh, headed up by Todd Wheatland, and he was talking about how to build visibility for videos your brand produces. And he also mentioned that by far most of the videos that go viral have actually at some point, point been promoted. And so really, the, over the course of a couple days, the, the message became clear that you need to put some paid behind your owned in order to generate earned. And there's something to be said for that. But in addition to actually doing all the good work that I think most of us are already doing with respect to finding influentials and targeting them and building those online relationships, we also have to think about actual just distributing content and driving discovery of that content by new relevant audiences, because ultimately that's how our content gets discovered. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. However, I'm going to be setting a little context. We're going to be talking a little bit about the evolution of the media information and attention marketplaces, and how these changes and in how information is consumed have changed by our behavior. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about the connection between search and social, uh, because obviously that is those are two key drivers of ongoing visibility for messaging and content. And then we'll get down and dirty into some tactics for actually driving discovery. So it probably goes without saying, uh, but I nonetheless still like to point out the fact that despite the huge audiences that traditional media commands, um, they are losing ground very rapidly, um, if they haven't already done so wholly and entirely, to digital on and online. And in fact, really the only um, traditional media format that is still competing with digital and online is television. However, uh, probably if it, if it hasn't happened already, later this year or early next, um, digital will surpass television as a primary source of news. And Therein lies both the opportunity and the challenge for communicators like us, because there is a sea of content out there. There is almost an infinite amount of content out there. And the, that's setting up challenges for our audience, because 
there's actually more than they consume, there's more than they want, and they're responding to uh, this pressure in some different ways which have real ramifications for communicators. Uh, first and foremost, uh, instead of looking for broad swaths of content, our audiences are looking for really granular information. And this, I just thought, was a stunning announcement from Google. The fact that almost 20% of the searches they get each day, and it, 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 this article says 15%, but more recently I've seen uh, numbers, uh, I've seen articles quoting 18 to 20% of searches, so it's going up. Um, the, the searches, a large quantity of the searches they're receiving are unique, never before seen sets of keywords, which with when you consider the total volume of searches that Google receives, that's pretty astonishing. So one way our audiences are responding to this pressure of all this content, uh, they are drilling into real specific, uh, really granular terms when they search. They're looking for uh, literally the needle in the haystack. They're also, however, OK with branded content. And this is good news for communicators. The uh, interesting, there's a great uh, infographic from the folks at Share Through uh, talking about the attention that audiences pay native content versus editorial content. And on the um, left-hand side of the screen, I thought it was really interesting that um, people are actually consuming native advertising at a higher degree than they are editorial content. And they're spending comparable amounts of time on that content. And so uh, there's a really good opportunity here for brands to communicate credibly and also granularly to attract audience attention. And that's crucial, because if we don't have content out there that is communicating on our behalf, we are simply put not included in the customer's decision-making process. They are very busy. Uh, doing research before they self-identify and get in touch with the vendor. Uh, Google calls this the zero moment of truth, Z-M-O-T. If you, if you search that, you'll find a lot of research from Google on this topic. But simply put, a brand has to have compelling, granular, interesting, relevant content out there promoting and representing the brand uh, in order to capture people who are early in the decision process because they're doing research. And if you don't have content there, you'll miss your audience. So the reality is that we're competing against this ocean of content um, again, for a really finite and increasingly specific uh, set of audience attention. And so therein lies both the opportunity and the conundrum for, uh, for communicators. Just to add one final twist to this is the Google Hummingbird update, which uh, was recently released. It's a whole new, it's actually not an update. I misspoke there. It's a whole new algorithm. And I'm sure everyone's heard about it. And it takes aim at those unique searches that I mentioned, and simply the fact that people are looking for more and more granular, specific information. And there's something kind of interesting going on with respect to how content is getting ranked in searches as well. Um, this is from June, so it predates Hummingbird. I would think that these numbers are even higher now, post-Hummingbird. But what's interesting here is, simply put, that the that seven of the top 10 ranking factors here in the US are derived from social channels. And when you step back and think about it, that's really not that surprising. Because even if, for example, uh, Google can't completely uh, spider all the content on Facebook, there's still outbound touches from the social network. Groups of people still go out and click on links that are shared within the social networks, whether or not Google can see it. Google is still pretty good at understanding who we are. And it is interpreting that behavior. So when a bunch of like-minded people go click on a particular link, uh, they are actually giving that interaction a lot, of, a lot of weight in their algorithm. And I believe they're right to do so, because that action really is a strong indicator of relevance and utility and context of the content. And so as we're thinking about driving content discovery, uh, an underlying theme that I think is really important is this whole idea of relevance. Because you need to be reaching the right people with a relevant message in order to generate the same the sort of relevant social interactions and getting people to share content among their peers and generating even more of the sorts of interactions from social networks that will help you amplify your messages. So we are going to talk now about the actual tactics 
that we can employ to drive content discovery. And you're going to see that I take, I borrow a lot of tactics from big media. And there's an important reason why. Even though um, traditional media outlets, and I'm in that, um, under that umbrella, I'm including both your large print publications like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, as well as smaller niche, niche publications, whether um, we're talking about professional journals or special interest magazines, so everything, the whole gamut, radio stations, television, the works, um, they still command enormous audience. They might be struggling in terms of actual revenue, but they still command enviable audience, and in many cases that audience is really well qualified and focused, and so um, that's what marketers are all about, reaching those types of people. So I think that we can absolutely take lessons from traditional media. So here's um, one of my favorite tactics, and this is from the EE Times website. Uh, EE Times is uh, uh, an electronics engineering uh, website and so really tightly focused content. But I think it's really interesting to look at the content that is um, not just most popular on a website, but the content that has driven the most interaction. So here on the left side, you see the headlines that were most commented upon. On the right side, you see the headlines that are most popular in terms of views. So when you actually look at the most commented upon headlines, you see a big difference between the most popular headlines. Those most popular headlines actually contain a lot of search terms. The, the big brand name Toyota is in the top three, and then it's followed by Apple iPad. Those are probably views that are less well qualified for the EE Times audience. That's my guess. However, when you look at the content that's actually generated more traction with the audience, you see those headlines really speak to um, issues that concern engineers, um, how to do things better. And so if you are developing content for this, this particular audience using the most commented content, content or alternatively the content that's shared most often on social networks or the content that has been uh, most emailed or most downloaded, um, those are good guides because that's the content that's generated traction with the audience. Now, another great way to build visibility into your editorial calendar is to really keep track of current events. So it's a little bit more difficult to plan for this, but here's a great example of one company that did it very well. FM Global is an insurance company, and on the heels of a presidential re report from the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force issued earlier this year, they took a bunch of content that they had sitting on their shelves, they bundled it together, and they surfaced it, in this case using a press release that went out to thousands of websites, to their audiences. And I say audiences plural because when you dig into this content, and I've, I've um, extracted the bullet points from the release that link through to the content, you can see some of it, such as the Hurricane Prep 101 is, that particular piece of content is really kind of basic. That's for um, the business or the home consumer. Um, tells them how to you know, make provisions um, and plan for a hurricane. On down to the approval guide and some of the risk essentials, those are some really more sophisticated data pieces that would be used by an industry analyst or possibly a journalist covering um, a, a story or maybe a, a risk officer at a corporation. But either way, you know, they didn't produce all this content in the wake of this particular report. They had it sitting there on their shelves, and they surfaced it. They basically gave it a whole new set of fresh and new context by wrapping it into um, a communication around this report. They used, smart, or they used trackable URLs to link through to every asset so that they would be able to tell exactly what sort of visibility they got from this particular release and also what content resonated most strongly with their audiences. Obviously tying thought leadership pieces to timely events is a tactic that also works. Here's an example from a financial communications firm that actually promoted blog posts around the Facebook IPO to gain traction for their CEO's new book as well as to increase their thought leadership footprint. In this case, too, uh, with respect to discovery, they also uh, did some content distribution through PR Newswire, and they were able to drive increased traffic to their blog as well. Now, important note, 
I work for PR Newswire. Obviously, this is the data I have. But I think that it's really important to think about stepping back and taking our marketing content and wrapping a timely and topical cloak around it and promoting that as news, whether it's an email you send out to some journalists or bloggers in your space, or you actually do what these two companies have done and put it into a press release and ship it out via a newswire. The fact of the matter is, acting that, stressing the newsworthiness of the content that you've built is actually a great way to get some follow-on visibility for your messaging. Here's another example of um, how you can actually use some editorial guidelines to do so. Um, if you look at the publications that are important for your business, you can actually find their editorial calendars. And I strongly recommend that you acknowledge that and you even use some of that information when you're setting your own editorial calendars. Because uh, without a doubt, those important publications are going to set a certain amount of tone and visibility around discussion when they are publishing content or publishing articles about specific topics. They, the, the editorial from big publications still drives a lot of social conversation. And so you can, for your brand, grab those coattails and capture some attention for your own brand if you are also communicating around that topic or commenting on that topic or have additional content ready to go to frame that topic at the same time it's being published. And the publications will tell you when that's happening. If you go to their website and you look uh, in their About section and you pull up their media kit, within that, within that media kit, in most cases, you will find an editorial calendar. Now that said, you should also look a little further afield. In addition to looking at industry publications, look at the sort of publications that your audience is likely to read. So riffing on the EE Times example from earlier, if your audience are engineers, chances are pretty good they read Scientific American well in, as well in their downtime. And look at this. Here in May, you've got a whole feature section r devoted to manufacturing, the future of manufacturing. And so EE Times might have been a prospective outlet you know, on an ongoing basis for your brand. But here, Scientific American is also offering editorial opportunities that you could either build content around and comment upon, or that you could actually frame content for, work with your PR department, and actually earn some media. On that topic, you have to look at the nature of news. Um, and you also have to think about the fact that journalists, in many cases, are now responsible for producing not just articles for their beat or um, information for their programs, but they're also contributing to the news organization's blog. They are developing and curating um, their own social channels as well as contributing to the social presences of their organization. So they have content demands that are as taxing, if not more taxing, than our own. And so it's, there's some interesting opportunities to be had by just getting these guys to write about as well as, as, well as share and tweet the content that our brands are producing as well. Because if you develop something that is of interest, you know that it's going to be of interest to your audience, guess what? It's of interest to the audiences of some of these media outlets as well. And so you can really exponentially increase your opportunities to earn attention by thinking about the news hook. Here's an example. Uh, this is uh, an infographic from a, com a company called Vibes. They issued it last year in the run-up to the holiday season. You might remember there was a lot of discussion about showrooming. And they actually, you know, how that was going to kill retail. So they, they did a survey. They did a study. They did an infographic. And then out of that, they pulled a news hook. And my advice is to take a really hard look at the research or the white papers or the content that your organization is producing and really ask yourself, what's the most interesting finding or fact that emerges from this content? That is probably a great news hook. In this case, in Vibe's case, they argued that showrooming could actually be good for business, that it wasn't going to kill big box retail as uh, was being widely reported. And that was a contrarian view, and they earned a ton of media uh, as well as a ton of website traffic based on the results. The downloads of their infographic went through the roof, 
and it's continued to go, it's, it's continued to produce results even today, a year on. So really paying attention to those interesting facts and turning them into news and hanging them under the noses of the right people. At the very least, you're probably going to get some tweets from journalists who have followings that are highly relevant to your business. And then the best case scenario is something like you're seeing right here in front of your screen. So we're talking about distribution and marketing your marketing. And working for PR Newswire, as you might imagine, I have unfettered access to lots of different distribution channels. And I monkey with them. I play with them. I'm constantly, um, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Uh, I use this stuff. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it works less well. Uh, here is a case where it worked quite well. We, uh, being a, a good content marketing company ourselves, are aspiring to be, we produced an explainer video that talked about our multimedia production services. And we, of course, shared that on our blog and in our social channels. And uh, it really didn't get that much attention. And so then we wrapped it into a multimedia press release, and we sent it out to media and um, the websites that syndicate PR Newswire copy. and a variety of different social channels that we display the content on, so on and so forth. And you know, within the first day, we had almost 200 more likes of the content on Facebook. And this is a pretty niche B2B video play. I mean, this is not a kitten riding a strip of bacon through the universe. This is um, a, a video about creating uh, explainer videos to support your brand. So um, not the most interesting thing in the world, although very interesting to us. But as you can see, that act of actually putting some muscle behind the message, we were able to seed a lot of visibility. And um, most importantly, in this case, we got more than 30,000 um, video views of this video, which um, for us is a real win. So another tactic that I like to use that doesn't involve uh, spending money or using vendors is just good old-fashioned um, influencer relations. If you're into vid visual storytelling, um, as I am, there's a guy out in um, uh, Silicon Valley named Lou Hoffman who runs the Hoffman Agency. And he's, for a long time, on his blog, Ishmael's Corner, been talking about storytelling. And we've been developing a lot of content around visual storytelling as well. And uh, in fact, I, so I, I started talking to Lou about this. I interviewed him for an ebook I wrote on the topic, and here's an excerpt from it that you can see. Gave him a nice quote, linked to his agency, linked to his blog. And then to promote that, this is what uh, our designer calls a social nibble. She creates a little, uh, a little tidbit uh, with a quote or a visual, um, small scale, that we can share on social channels. And we got some really nice visibility from Lou. He shared it on Twitter. He actually put um, a link to the ebook on the homepage of his um, his agency website. He mentioned it on his blog, where he's got a bunch of people who also talk about visual storytelling. And so, in terms of a really highly qualified audience and people who care about the topic, uh, Lou was a great conduit for that. Um, we continued our relationship just last week. Uh, He's calling me part of his storytelling posse. Um, I'm very flattered by that. Uh, you're looking at a tweet on this page that he sent me um, last week for a blog post he's uh, working on. And so the conversation continues, and he and I will continue to amplify and extend each other's messages. And it's entirely painless and very easy and very it's, it's very effective. So there are lots of free services out there that you can use. And um, I do encourage you to do so. However, I always tell people to look for distribution. Make sure that the site you're going to post your content on actually has an audience or has something else to offer. Because otherwise, you're just creating a landing page um, that's going to help the visibility of another website. And um, I'm really not impressed if they don't offer some sort of distribution or some sort of measurement or um, the ability to embed links. I just don't see how that can help your brand. However. If you have a variety of different angles that you want to convey, putting um, these different angles out there on free sites uh, can be very useful. Um, you see a couple of my favorites here, PR Log and Pitch Engine. I think they do a pretty good job. Um, if you are looking at these sites, um, number one, um, I do think you need to be aware of the fact that Google does have press release sites in their, um, in their sites or in, in their uh, <laughs> Under the microscope would be a better way to look at it. Um, a reputable uh, news release vendor or PR site will use nofollow attributes in the links. 
um, you need to be really careful of sites that have an overemphasis on SEO and say, um, if you post your news here, you'll be land in the top five slots on Google News or things like that. Um, just be very careful of those. You want to stay away from those because you could incur a penalty. Something else to think about when using the free sites is just don't repeat tactics that don't work. Um, if you find one that works, great. Um, but do be sure to measure it because ultimately um, we all have limited time, uh, energy, and resource. And something that uh, takes you time to produce but doesn't produce results um, is ultimately a waste of pretty valuable resource. So always be sure to balance time and effort against your results. Get measurement and be sure to measure. Now, with respect to measuring, uh, PR Newswire issues about 1,000 press releases a day, and we uh, put them up there on our website uh, for uh, all time. And so we have a really good view of the long tail of content. And one thing we've noticed is that that tail is growing, that uh, press releases now accrue their views over a much longer period of time. It takes about four months for 80% of a press release's views to come in the door. And so I think that there's a really important lesson there for content uh, creators to be thinking about. Uh, because you need to be looking at your results over time. Obviously, we all know that our prospects don't enter our funnels uh, all at the same time. Um, having good good content out there will help capture them and bring them into the content or bring them into the, our funnels and into our realms uh, fluidly and over time. But you'll want to continue to measure the effectiveness of content well after you publish it. So now we are going to trot through a number of tactics that uh, I know for a fact work and will help you develop content that gets more visibility, whether it's a blog post or an article you post on your website or a press release you send out over a wire service, whatever. However you publish it, these things will help you get visibility. First of all, headline length. It's really important. Not only does it capture the visibility and, and capture the attention of your audience, um, it also informs search engines and encourages people to tweet. So really, just make sure you write wonderful headlines that are interesting to your readers. However, we suggest you keep them short. We see a real drop off in readership after about 120 characters. And so we, uh, for a variety of other reasons, say that about 100 characters is in the sweet spot. And you do want to lead with important ideas or keywords. Multimedia also works. Again, when we step back and we look at a slew of you know, 20 to 30,000 press releases, we chop them up into formats, text only, text plus photo, text plus video, and so on. And when we line up the results, the content that has a visual performs significantly better than plain text. There are a whole variety of reasons for this. Obviously, people are visual animals. We have eyes. We like to use them. But also, search engines and social networks surface content that has visuals, A, because it draws more traction from readers, but also it, um, it just makes more, more a, a better experience for their users as well. So for a whole variety of reasons, and also because uh, social networks like Pinterest and Instagram require visuals, um, without them, you miss those audiences entirely. So I guess the message here is use visuals in your content. If you are writing a press release or an article, um, avoid doing what I call the speed bump. Um, there's an, an alarming trend to put company boilerplate in the lead paragraph. And that does nothing. You can write a brilliant headline, but then if you hit your readers with a paragraph like this right off the bat, you will lose their attention. So just continue to be interesting. Simply put, you have to format your content, whether it's written content or visual content, like an infographic or a video. You have to keep your readers reading. You have to keep your watchers watching. You cannot assume that once they have opened your press release or clicked on your video that they are going to continue to give you their attention. You have to earn it with every single word or second. And so in addition to a headline, uh, you can use a subhead in this case. I, this is a great example where um, They've got a keyword, a short, punchy headline. They have a really interesting subhead that keeps the measure, or that keeps the interest going. In this case, um, this particular organization uh, turned their lead paragraph into bullet points, which I actually liked a lot because the bullet points make it easy for the reader to scan and find an issue that they're particularly interested in. So this is a really great example of how a piece of content can be structured to grab attention keep attention, and then keep reinforcing the attention. 
Um, in this case, um, they put a, a call to action right after the first paragraph, which is a tactic I love. And then, as someone's attention could be wavering, they offered up a video. And then finally, uh, another tactic that I really liked was the fact that you simply had an interesting quote from somebody who is actually from the industry and really cares about the topic. Um, nobody likes those what I call ego quotes, where you've, you're quoting a partner or an executive who's droning on about how excited they are about a particular announcement. Um, this guy is actually talking about real wor world experience. You could argue that he tells a story, a complete story, within this quote. It's interesting stuff. So never miss the opportunity to be interesting in the content that you publish. So I mentioned earlier about um, embedding a CTA near the top of a page. Um, here is another example. Um, we were actually working with uh, Jive Software's marketing and PR team to increase the conversion rate of their press releases. And you heard me right, conversion rate of press releases. And so we suggested that they put that a uh, call to action, in this case a, a download uh, of an app, right after the first paragraph. And we also had them tweak their, um, their headlines. Um, in, in this case, we were telling them to uh, put some particular search keywords in their headline, not because of the fact that iPad and iPhone are huge search keywords, but because that makes the content really relatable. If you've got an iPad, you know, an iOS device, or an Android device, um, this press release is important to you, or potentially important to you. Um, this communicates that this app will work for you. It makes it relatable. And employing these tactics over time increased visibility and specifically traffic to a website that they were promoting by more than 200%. So the CMO was happy. So the final thoughts, um, really, as you move forward, simply think about building an element of distribution into all the content you produce. Uh, whether you are using an editorial calendar to inform your content calendar, or you are atomizing a blog post into different crunchy little bits that tell different stories that you can send out via different channels, um, driving that ongoing content of your discovery is crucial, but it actually takes a lot of deliberate work. And that's it. Thank you very much. Here are my, um, my Twitter handle and my LinkedIn page, um, great ways to get in touch with me. And also, I, I wrote an ebook on this whole topic of discovery. There are more tips and examples in this, and it's free. So um, if you're interested, you can grab that as well. And Quinn, I think uh, at this point, I hand it back over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a lot of information, and I'm sure we can all use it in some way. Um, we do have some time for questions, so if you still had a question you'd like to ask Sarah, go ahead and use the little chat applet, and we'll go ahead and have a discussion with her. And you can also tweet us uh, with the hashtag VMWebinar. Um, so our first question is kind of harkening back to the beginning of your presentation with Hummingbird. So you touched on that briefly, and the question is, do you have any content pitfalls that you can recommend now that the Hummingbird algorithm is in place. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the Hummingbird algorithm, which is really designed around that problem that I mentioned earlier, the fact that uh, Google gets so many unique searches, um, really puts the impetus on uh, or the pressure on content marketing uh, folks as well as other communicators to produce content that is more interesting and relevant to the audiences and specifically talks about um, things the audience cares about whether it is a, a problem or an opportunity. Um, simply put, and this is the big pitfall, I, I think that generalization no longer works. You can't, for example, um, if you work for a garden company, you can't expect to go uh, out with a story that will appeal to the top 100 garden bloggers because you might have people who um, are into biodynamic gardening or gardening with native plants or just pick up whatever's pretty at Home Depot and believe in um, better living through chemistry and use you know, pesticides with abandon. Um, you cannot appeal to those three audiences with one message, or it's really unlikely that you'll do so. And so um, Hummingbird um, and the fact that social really does play a heavy role in informing search rank requires us to be more relevant and more targeted and focused in the content we produce. And ultimately, um, I think that we'll all get better results. If you 
reach fewer people, but they're more engaged with your topic, and they have networks of people who are also engaged with the topic, ultimately, I think you're going to get better results and more lasting, um, lasting benefit, whether it's word of mouth or actual conversions, by really drilling into the core audience rather than um, taking the throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks approach. I think that's great advice, and I think that's a huge takeaway when you said generalization no longer works. I mean, we've been saying that in our own business and with our clients, and it, becoming a niche and becoming very specialized is super important, so thanks for that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah. Um, well, our second question is about repurposing, which you talked about throughout your presentation, and they asked, do you have any good examples of repurposing or best methods or things to think about when you're doing this? So you know, repurposing can um, mean a few different things. And I think that, um, however, the, the rule of thumb to think, think about when you're repurposing content is, how do I make it fresh, new, and interesting to my readers? You know, the example I give, um, I watched Breaking Bad from end to end. <laughs> and I was traveling on the Sunday night of the, the last episode. And uh, so I was not able to watch it live, which nearly killed me. And so I put myself into social media oblivion and just like completely disconnected for a couple days and uh, finally got to watch that final episode all by myself a few days later. Did I care that that episode was old? No. It was timely and relevant to me at the moment. And so when you think about uh, the fact that people are searching for and doing research on our brands unbeknownst to us, and that they are doing so with no regard, very rudely, um, no regard to our marketing timelines and calendars. Um, repurposing content and the act of making it fresh and current um, is actually a great opportunity for us. It's pretty easy to do. We already have the content developed. You just have to find a different wrapper that will make it germane at the time. And that's why I loved that FM Global example that I gave, because they tied it to, they were really heads up, this announcement came out, the survey or the, the commission report came out, and they jumped on it and acted. And really any sort of industry trend or development that would affect your audience represents that sort of opportunity. And so I would, um, I think that the rule of thumb is if there's some sort of context that you can use to make the content new and interesting to the audience at that time, go for it. Great. And I think this next question kind of flips with what you're talking about but expands on it. She says, do you mention that you will create many different versions of a piece of content with different multimedia approaches? Do you do this for every piece of content? Is it worth the effort? What combinations have worked best? So I don't do it for every piece of content because um, a person could go crazy doing that. However, um, if, for example, I've got a blog post with some tips, again, you know, PR Newswire, where a big piece of our business is press releases. I spend a lot of time talking about press release tactics. And so if I have some new tactics or some new research, I will, um, our designer might do a, an infographic and then we'll also create a little deck on SlideShare because that represents a, a different specific audience, especially with its um, connection to LinkedIn. And so um, that, in that case, makes sense because we, you've got a lot of PR professionals on both SlideShare and LinkedIn. So my audience is there. They like tips and tactics. So ergo, yes, I'll definitely create a, a subset of content for them. Um, however, another example of um, atomizing content um, came in um, Amazon when they announced the, their new Kindle most recently. The new Kindle has a variety of features and they actually highlighted them in 14 different tweets. And I thought it was a great guide to all the different stories that exist within a product announcement. Um, you, a, a content marketer could have entertained themselves for hours creating a content plan around those 14 tweets. Um, some of the tweets were about uh, new features that scrolled lyrics as movies were playing or song titles as movies were playing or outtakes um, of videos and things like that. So there's a heavy entertainment component. Um, another uh, new feature is their Mayday button. So if you're having technical problems, 
you can actually push this Mayday button and get a live person. Um, as someone who uh, is, plays the tech support role to an elderly parent, um, I can't tell you how attractive that idea is to me, um, a Mayday button that goes to technical support and not me. Um, so a really interesting story there, I think, about uh, you know, the role that we play as technical support to elderly parents or to children or children play to us. Um, the Mayday button, you, you, you could develop so many story ideas around that. And then there, then there was the whole um, the physical specs of the device, you know, very small, very thin, very light, great for travelers, great battery life, a whole new set of um, story ideas from that as well. So I think that rather than just breaking up content into bits, you have to look at the different story elements and think about the audiences those would appeal to and tell those stories specifically. Um, I have an encyclopedic knowledge of 80s lyrics. I do not need uh, my Kindle device to scroll lyrics at me when I'm watching old videos. However, the Mayday button, enormously um, attractive to me. And so those two different stories would make or break uh, my particular interest in that device. So I think that's, that's a, a you know, kind of an interesting example. Yeah, I will definitely have to look that up. Um, we have time for one more question, and it's about something you mentioned, the social nibble, which is a great <laughs> term that I think I'm going to steal and use. Um, but could you speak a little bit more about the social nibble, how you use it, and um, when you use it as well? Yeah, absolutely. So if we've got um, a slide deck with an interesting page, or if we have an infographic that, as many of them are, are really just too big to fit comfortably on a screen, um, will or, or to render well on Twitter or Facebook or some other social network, we will create a graphic. We'll pluck a particular fact out of uh, the infographic and illustrate it. Or we will take that one page from the slide deck and turn it into um, an appropriately sized visual. And then we will use that particular nibble, as we call it, um, on a blog post or in a press release or on a social network to drive traffic back to or drive awareness of the larger piece of visual content, um, whether it's the video or the slide deck or the infographic. So it just is really um, making that content more portable, which will make it more immediately visual, visually appealing and encourage people to click on the full content. Great. Uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah. Thanks for all of this information from all of us to you. Um, we'll have all this video and the slides available for everyone so you can recap. Um, but thanks for being with us, Sarah. We appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Quinn. Yeah, no problem. And everyone, please mark your calendar for our next webinar. It's December 12th. And our Vice President of Client Solutions at Vertical Measures, Mike Huber, will be speaking on the topic, How Changes in SEO Will Affect Your Website in 2014 and Beyond. This will be a really interesting topic and also fitting to many of the things Sarah mentioned today with Hummingbird and the different updates that have happened. Uh, it was I'm going to mark my you. calendar and tune into that. Yeah, definitely. He's a wealth of knowledge on it. So he'll prepare us and recap on the 2013 updates, as well as look at how you can be proactive to not get a penalty in 2014 moving forward. Um, so mark your calendar for that. Registration will be open tomorrow for that. Again, I'm Quinn from all of us at Vertical Measures. Thank you for your time, and have a great day. Bye.